so my name is Jason Hirshhorn. We've got a really great panel today uh, around virtual reality. I'm sure you guys have been playing with the toys and, and been reading everything about it. And if you were at CES or Sundance or any place in really the last year, it's, it's the talk. And um, I certainly think it's one of those moments in media that come you know, once every 20 years. And as you've seen from the experiences, it's pretty great. So just wanted to start on this end. Just introduce yourself. What do you do? And then we'll, we'll rock and roll. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm uh, Ted Galliano, and I'm president of post-production for 20th Century Fox. Uh, I oversee the movies that come from the studio. Hi, I'm David Greenbaum. I'm the senior vice president of production at Fox Searchlight Studios. Uh, I also work in the Fox Innovation Lab with Ted Galliano and Ted Shilowitz, who's down at the end. Hi, everybody. My name is Brad Herman, and I lead up a group called Dream Lab at DreamWorks Animation and we're focused on mobile, immersive, and interactive technology and storytelling. We take cutting edge technology, some of which we develop ourselves, and combine that with our storytelling expertise to create new consumer facing experiences. Hi, I'm Jason Holtman, I'm head of platform at Oculus. I basically run a bunch of the stuff that isn't the hardware, isn't the stack, so it's the ways you get content, the way we get content, and, and various ways of the, or all the things that you see. And I'm Ted Chilowitz, I'm Fox's futurist. Actually, all these guys are futurists, but it actually says that on my business card, so. I'm the futurist at Fox. So, you know, game developers, sci-fi writers, you know, anybody interested in the future has been talking about virtual reality for a long time. What is it about the last, you know, sort of 18 months to two years? Uh, I'll throw it to you first, Jason. Wh why is virtual reality happening now? What were the elements that are making it happen? Well, it's, it's happened a few times. Like, you can go look 20 years back and you'll see pictures of people with gloves on and headsets. A bunch of what's happened is the technology has just come to bear. Some of the right people have come to bear. Uh, and everybody's just come together right at this right moment. It has tried to happen before. Uh, it's never gotten this far. And I think now that you know, there's these humps or sort of like slopes you can get on, it seems like it's going to go. Like for sure, you've got producers, you've got creators, you've got hardware, you've got people like Facebook going, I'd like to do that. Uh, but enough technology and enough thoughts come along so that it can happen. I mean, you just need a certain amount of rendering power to make things happen. You can't just project images in front of your, your face. So I really do think it's, the, it's, a, it's a collection of those things. So certainly we, we hear about it, I, I would love to know Oculus's point of view, but certainly we're hearing about it through the game's point of view, through the film point of view. Um, you guys are sort of the beginning in setting the agenda as being the, the big reference platform out there. Um, for anybody here, I mean, is it games and movies in the next, you know, 18 to 24 months? Um, and what does that mean for games and movies? Like, you know, what are the experiences going to be like? Um, and is that your focus as a company? Yeah, and I'll, I'll be brief and then let these guys talk about it a little bit. I think games and movies are an easy place to start. Games make a lot of sense because people want to interact. The first thing you see in VR, even if you show somebody something, they immediately go like this. I mean, they know better. Within 10 seconds, they're going like this. They want to move around. Um, so games make a lot of sense because the people that make games are good at two fundamental, th well, three fundamental. They can entertain you, they can put the right triangles in front of your eyes, and they know how to make interaction fun. Movies are the same way. As a matter of fact, <coughs> movies surprised us a little bit. Uh, you've seen movies a bunch in Gear VR. We built Oculus Cinema inside, and then once we had it out in the wild and people started watching things, we realized that watching movies inside of VR, not, not projecting them on a panel close up like you'd see those old viewers, but literally like rendering a theater around you and watching it is a really fundamental transformative experience too. So even the old, or not old, the regular flat movies or the regular 3D movies that you see now can be quite compelling, not to mention what the guys at Fox have done. Sure, and is there any post-processing or anything that needs to happen in order for someone to watch you know, a movie through Oculus? It depends on what you want to do, but no. I mean, you can basically take a lot of the fundamental things that are built right now and with very little effort, get them in and watch them. And the interesting thing is what you can build around them. So folks who haven't seen it yet, the, we, we basically built a virtual theater. And what happens is you go and you can, one of the demos we used to give is we have you watch Night of the Living Dead, right? Black and white, flat, not even, you know, no exciting 3D. But it depends on the theater you render around people. So people would start watching it and go, that's pretty cool. And then you'd say, look to the left. And they'd look to the left and realize that the ambient light from the screen was hitting a a seat next to them, or things were going on behind, or that you could put somebody next to them. And people go, oh, I see. So you don't have to do a bunch of post-processing. You can go to a much higher extreme, like the guys at 
Fox did, and they can tell you about that, where they've sure. gone well beyond what you ordinarily would film. So for the Fox gents, you know, obviously we've seen things like 3D and other innovations inside of the theater, and often to get butts in seats, um, we're making you know, films in 3D that maybe shouldn't be made in 3D. You know, what is your goal for virtual reality um, at the studio? And you know, I, I find it interesting in that you're driving innovation there, and normally that's the job of the filmmaker. Um, you know, what's your vision for it, and then how are you interacting and educating with filmmakers? I think from my standpoint, what, what's different about VR this time is just the phone. The phone is a computer that can be a screening room with you anywhere. And because we are, at our core, content creators, anytime somebody's got a phone that becomes a theater that can come around you, that's really interesting to us. The fact that it does so much other things of being inside a movie, inside a story, which is what we did on Wild, that's a game changer for us. Yeah, and I would say, you know, we are essentially a hub for creative uh, thought and creative, uh, well, creation. So the idea is if we have both the IP and we have the filmmakers that are there on the lot and we can bring talent in and introduce them to the technology, essentially what we're really doing is educating ourselves, doing R&D, learning, and ultimately, we hope, we'll be sort of basically creating content that we can share through Oculus through you know, Gear VR, through Crescent Bay, through um, all the iterations that are to come. I mean, you know, a filmmaker <laughs> comes with, they do things a certain way and they have a certain style. Um, you know, they come in to see you guys and maybe they're not used to the technology. Are they trying to apply old thinking to the new technology or are there best practices that you are, you know, putting in front of someone? Um, you know, how do you explain narrative in a virtual reality space? Yeah, well, they, they usually start with preconceived notions. And then we kind of look at it as our job to let them know this is an exploration and we're here to break down barriers and preconceived notions. So try and come to it with a clean a slate as possible. And it's actually really beneficial, like Jason was making reference to, to have things that come from things you're very familiar with, like a movie theater. It sets the stage for an understanding of what it can be. And that's a good starter sort of experience. And then you take them further and then you put them in a fully immersive environment and let them interact with it and play games with it. And we essentially watch them learn and everybody learns a little differently, but I would say overwhelmingly, I could literally say 100%, um, which is a scary number to say. Sure. Everybody we brought into our VR bunker, which is this sort of mystical playland where we test all these things and work and figure all these things out, walks away transformed. They Absolutely. say, this is amazing, how do I figure out how to do it? and then we start on our journey in each of these projects. And, you should, and we should say one thing. There's, right now, there's sort of a bifurcation that's happened already, which is you have filmmakers, like at Sundance and New Frontiers, which just happened last week, who are specializing in VR and essentially are the next generation, the Spielbergs, the Coppolas, the Kubricks. These are, these are basically, they're breaking rules and experimenting and are using this as their, basically their initial film language, right? And then you have what we're doing, which is introducing it to Ridley Scott and Jean-Marc Vallée and folks who are, that we're working with on the lot who are then coming into it basically totally new. Yep. Um, and, and they're relying upon the next generation to sort of inform them and we're sort of, it's a very collaborative and, a, and I would say like a, a very early stage, but um, it's gonna be interesting to see whether or not traditional filmmakers will say, okay, I'm gonna jump into VR or whether it's really gonna be about a whole new hotbed of filmmaking activity with people who are starting in VR. I'm super interested in the idea that, you know, a filmmaker works within a frame. Um, game developers less so because they've been able to have the 360 for some while. But when I demoed with you yesterday at the, at the, at the studio, the wild um, Reese Witherspoon, I'm looking directly. I forget that I can go, you know, sort of 360. And then, so I'm looking for this sort of flat narrative. And then, you know, with a little push from you in the swivel chair, all of a sudden I have a 360 narrative and that opens up a world for you, and then as a user, you want to walk the, the first, so I brought my, uh, my niece to, to get some brownie points as an uncle over to Fox, <laughs> and uh, David demoed. You're welcome. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, and David demoed for us, and immediately what she said was when she knew that she could walk around, um, she, you know, she goes, is it interactive or is this passive? Smart, smart young one. And uh, immediately they wanted to go deeper, which means that the narrative changes. Um, is the future of film multiple narratives like a video game where the user is in control? I mean, is the, is the audience going to be the final director of film? So, 
I would say there's a lot more of a complex question to that. I don't think that's the answer for film, if you consider film to be a linear medium. I think there's going to be amazing linear long form content that's authored for VR that's beautiful. But I think you're going to see a wealth of new medium that is really a much more diverse thing. So you have short form experiences that are much more akin to an amusement park ride. You have things that harken back to Zork and early text adventures where it really is a choose your own adventure. A lot like we think of video games today with a visceral quality and emotional resonance haven't seen in most media. So, for example, I may not be able to um, affect the story. So if it was Star Wars, for example, or in your case, uh, How to Train Your Dragon 2, I could walk into the world, um, I maybe could get some feedback from the world, but I won't affect the story necessarily. Yeah, I, I think you're going to see really the, the absolute dichotomy from one end to the other. On one end, you're going to have you know, directors like Chris Milk who are going to have a visionary experience that you're going to see start to end the way he wants you to see it. Sure. And I think on the other end, you're going to have the EVE Online's, the open worlds where it is a pervasive world that exists when you're there or not there, and it's a community aspect. I think, th and that's very social, by the way. I think one of the things that hasn't been touched on as much right now is that over the next 12 to 18 months, social is going to be a huge part of VR. There's a group that does karaoke every week in VR. Like, it's just a regular 100 people show up every week to do it. So how, how is that going to work? I mean, I, I've used Second Life before. I could walk around eight hours on the beach there and not see anybody. So, so what, what does that mean? What does social mean in VR? <laughs> I think it's more about the reasoning behind Facebook buying Oculus. I mean, you think about the fact that people say, well, VR is a very solitary experience. You have this big thing on your head. Well, think about actually how solitary it is when you're looking down at your phone and posting a status update to Facebook. You're only there. I, I never feel more full. <clears throat> OK. So, but the thing is, you're making a social connection and having relationships with those people. You find out that they're engaged, that people are getting married, like all kinds of like, big life events you find out from a Facebook feed these days. If you take that to the next step, you take that into a world where people are spending a decent amount of time in VR, there's going to be places that you go where your friends hang out. It's not going to be this big empty expanse. It's going to be your living room and your friends are hanging out in your living room or a space that you, through UGC, built collaboratively, like the man cave you always wanted but don't have room for in your house. Yep. So, so Brad and I spend a lot of time together talking about this stuff. Vir virtually we, talking yeah. to one yeah. another? We, yeah. we, we, we do. We collaborate <laughs> in person and sometimes remotely about these things. Um, and we have these shared experiences that have led us to these very similar places to discuss what is the environment of VR from a social standpoint and will it work and will it be engaging And the way we look at it, because we've shared a lot of talk about this, is when you advance the visual experience beyond just what you're holding in your hand or this and it's literally all around you and you can use all that canvas, this essentially infinite amount of canvas to create a social environment or, or a solitary environment or somewhere in the middle, that's where it gets like your mind starts to blow up because you start to look at, well, I can put all my friends over here in this corner and I can grab them and open them up. I can play games with them at the same time. I can look at their avatars. Eventually, I can look at them in a fully three-dimensional world you know, with real um, photography or videography. And it's, it's, it's just this incredible mind play field that has been limited by geography right now. Right? It's, it's a geographic problem. Sure. Whereas when I create infinite geography, which of course you're living, living in all the time, forget about it. Like it's completely more engaging. So you're that's ne why you're never going to have to book a conference room again. Well, it's it's part of that. Part of that. And yeah. you know, there is something to also say about social VR in the same time. We built an eight person prototype ride that eight people in the same room in little ride chairs together and go on a three and a half minute experience together. Sure. All the people are actually transformed into elves. So when you look around, you would actually see the person next to you now as an elf, but you can actually see their motions and how they're moving. And such amazing, unexpected awesome. things sure. happen. Yeah. You know, we had kids trying this and they would reach over and grab their sister and shake them because they'd see the elf shaking and moving around and the head bouncing around. It, it's there, there, it's there in that presence, but they're actually able to just talk to each other because they're really in the room. So. These types of things help you reimagine what theme parks, what these types of things might be like in the future. So, Jason, you know, we're pontificating on why Facebook bought I know, Oculus. It was really interesting. Um, <laughs> there's probably nothing you've heard before. Um, I mean, is it going to, you know, when I first heard about the deal, um, I really focused on price in that I thought they made a steal. Um, and then I thought about, well, what are they going to do with this? I mean, is it going to be something where I, you know, I, I, I send a message to David and I say, hey, 
let's go see a movie, and we're gonna go see a movie together, we're just not gonna be together, and we're not gonna go to the theater, but I'm gonna be able to turn left or right, and he's gonna be in the seat, and I'm gonna be watching the movie. I mean, is that, what's Facebook thinking? How much of the roadmap do they actually know, um, and don't lie, um, or wow. how much of it is wow. just don't lie. And, and, don't lie. And how much tell of them not to lie? <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. Don't lie for <laughs> liars. Um, <laughs> nah, he's pointing that way. I mean, we're, we're from Hollywood. It comes easier to us. But uh, you know, how much of the roadmap do you think that Facebook understood, or is it something where Mark looked at Oculus and said, "This is a true north. I don't know exactly the coordinates, but we got to be in this." I think it's a little bit what you said about the latter, and I think it was a little bit of the true north. You can see a little. You can see some future. You can see because once you put it on, these things immediately happen with anybody. It's not. You don't need to be a technologist or a futurist to understand the possibilities. The other thing about Facebook and Oculus is Facebook is fundamentally this high engineering, iterative, exploratory place. They do lots of stuff, and it's an awfully good match for us. So, like the way we think about what might happen. You gave an example of like, hey, should I make a movie theater and put people down next to each other? Yep. It's certainly a possibility, but. We tend to be the kind of company where that sounds like high Stalinistic planning to us. Like, yeah, that's a possibility. But what we're actually going to do is try to remain somewhat surprised and involve lots of creators and developers. Because like this thing I just said about the movie cinema, like we had an idea that we needed to make you know, a few things and one of them would be a cinema because it was kind of easy. And now we've learned by watching people use it and what's interesting about it, that we're gonna start riffing on that and try to make it better with our partners as well. Sure. Uh, but you can see why Facebook would be interested. And I think it's an awfully good match. It's a really good accelerant, and it's a really good way of us you know, leveraging some pieces, but also staying true to exactly what we were doing before. I read a great quote today. It was from Palmer Luckey, who I think is one of the, uh, the founders. He is. And it said, people are narcissists, and they want people to see what they think uh, <coughs> are, are, their, are about their amazing lives. So how does that drive development um, at <laughs> Oculus? That's, uh, that's, that is yeah. one of the things that I would say. That's an, that, that's an opinion. It's a pretty good one. If you think about why people like to do Well, you're things, in Hollywood, so we know, know it's true here. If you think here. about why people like to do things, it actually brings up a good point about VR that isn't, wouldn't really be mostly touched on in this panel, in that there's all of these things that everybody in this room and these guys up on this panel would do together. We have a really high interest in UGC stuff, so the stuff like a Twitch would do or a Maker would do. And the reason why is that I don't, I don't actually, I wouldn't go as far as Palmer and say people are narcissists. I think what's actually true is we all like to make things. We just do. Like, I like to show you things, but I also like to, uh, you know, somebody mentioned today uh, that we would take pictures, but we'd no longer have a photo drawer, you know, that we like to show because we're broadcasting. I think that's kind of true in some of the business models we're doing, but the other thing that's true is we do like to keep things. Like, we like to make things, capture things, and I think uh, Brad had one, but there's a little camera now made by Rico. Yeah, he's always got do it. Do it, do it, he's gonna take, so this is a good example. So he's gonna, right now, he's gonna take a 360 picture of everybody, bang, he's gonna have that on his Done. Gear VR, and he can go home tonight, and if everybody, had, you can put it on, and you could look around this whole place. So imagine capturing something like your trip, your graduations, or those are the normal ones. The, the next ones that I think get interesting is when you put tools like this in people's hands, they start doing really interesting things. So instead of just like, here's the whole shot at my party, uh, we were playing around with this in my house the other day. We started putting it inside my piano, like getting these weird, like I'm artistic, the well, yeah. and, like weird artistic shots of like half sure. people. So I, I don't think it's because we're narcissistic. I think it's actually because one of the things that's opened up in the world now is everybody actually in their own way is kind of their own good creator. And we're gonna try to harness that. Because it can be very powerful in VR, like when you get in our, yeah, I, I would our say, photo viewer. And, and I think it's really important to just talk about the, the idea of presence and the idea, particularly with when you're capturing video, um, how that can be an experience that you could relive. So, for example, and I, I just talked about this when we were at Sundance, we did a panel. Um, you know, I filmed the birth of my child in VR. Now, you're I, didn't, the first. I chose an <laughs> angle that uh, was PG, but... It, it was, and I, and I, and I joke with David that he had his wife hold the camera. <laughs> <laughs> My wife's right there. She definitely did not hold the camera. Um, but but that, uh, ha that experience is one that I really genuinely can relive in a way that's very, very different from holding a camcorder uh, while my wife would be saying, put the fucking camcorder down. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's static. It's in the room. It's on a tripod. Um, it, it allows me to look out the window, out of Cedar sinai as well as all the nurses, everything that's going in, 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 inside that room. And the sound is captured as well. 
Um, and I have looked at it. I've, I haven't shown it to my wife yet, but I, I have looked at it. It's, uh, it's profound. It's a beautiful, incredible experience that um, I would say is not narcissistic so at all. What, it's, what David's it's referring to is, in addition to it being an amazing visualization tool, it's an amazing learning tool. <coughs> like what Brad did with that kind of picture actually sets a space, and we can learn kind of what happened, right? Taking a VR and doing a surgery or a birth or bringing it into learning for school children or you know um, just rehabilitation and things like that. So we're complete. We're fascinated by this. So yeah. let's talk about that. You and I have spoken about this before. So obviously we hear about games, we hear about movies. They seem the most obvious, but if you look at journalism, if you look at healthcare, yes. if you look at travel, if you look at education. These are really sectors that I think are going to be transformed. One of the things that we saw at Sundance was, I forget the name of it, but it was a piece of, I guess, virtual reality journalism of going into um, the life of a, of a refugee girl from Syria. Yeah. Uh, Nani, Nani De La Pena's no. work, uh, yeah. Project Syria. And you know, obviously, when you're watching the news and you see one screen at a time and you're seeing it through the filter of the journalist, I remember being in Beirut and um, someone who was the son of, a, of, of uh, one of the generals in the army there said to me, one of the frustrations that I have with news coming out of America is that, you know, you'll see people screaming about America, but if you're here and you pan to the left 10 feet and pan to the right 10 feet, there's no one there. And when you're in this immersive journalistic experience, you saw bombs go off, you saw squalor, you saw suffering. And I look at journalism as one of those areas that can truly be transformed in a positive way, oh could also be used for negative. But, so when you're learning, you're learning this learning stage, you're trying to educate filmmakers, yep. <coughs> what are the acumens that you're working with now and how are you taking the learnings from what you're hearing in these other sectors back to film? Right. So you make reference to something that for me personally was the most transformative thing for me at Sundance, being sort of having very heavy VR sea legs now, right? I spend at least as much of my day in a virtual world as I do in, a, in my version of a real world. And you're not talking about the film studio, you're talking no, about the headset. No, in VR, yeah. like you're, I'm, I'm in it. You're there right <laughs> now. I know Brad is You're there right now. Hey, yeah. take the pill. <laughs> I am there right now. I don't now. fly without it anymore. But um, Chris Milk did a couple of things. He did a piece about Syria, and he did, to me, a really amazing transformative piece about, he was in New York City when they were protesting about the guy who got um, strangled in the cigarette stuff. And they filmed this stuff, and while it was technically flawed all over the place because of what you had to do today with the technology and the cameras and stitching problems. That didn't mean at all to me. It didn't take me out of it at all. It actually made it more interesting because I knew that he was really right there doing it. And you could turn around and you could see him with his study cam operator like in the action. And the reporter was this very unrefined porter holding like a lavalier mic like this as sure. opposed to a real stick mic. And she was not a professional and she was in it. And I watched that for seven, eight minutes and took it off and went, Wow, I was just inside the story. Yeah. Not watching the story on a rectangle. I was in it. And I found and that, I felt it. And yeah. I, yeah. I found that that allowed you to have yeah. as the audience a level of empathy yeah. Yeah. for the subject that a framed rectangle couldn't have. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. What about yeah. medicine or healthcare? I mean, yeah. I went to Ted, e you should talk about yeah. that because we're both deeply involved. In so Ted, I, w I went to Egypt and I went into the Valley of the Kings, which you have to go down into a tomb where you're standing at a 90 degree angle. It's a thousand feet. It's 100 degrees. I would have rather have done that on virtual reality. <laughs> yeah. Well, Ted and I are very involved with UCLA on taking virtual reality to neurosurgery and all kinds of surgery. Uh, we filmed a, a, the first facelift in virtual reality and are introducing uh, this weekend in Vegas uh, a new surgical technique. So the, in surgery, the see one, do one, teach one, when you can actually be there in virtual reality, over the table, at the table, it's, it, we're, it, it's a whole new ball game for training residents in, in a brain surgery instead of them making a mistake. You'd rather they make a mistake in virtual reality. And uh, yeah. Yeah. there's a lot of other things that we're working on for taking data into virtual reality that Ted can speak to. We, we did a, um a pro bono piece uh, around the space shuttle at the California Science Center where they actually opened it up for a day and let us move some cameras around. We did it with a group called Wemo Labs and another group using a whole bunch of red cameras in San Diego. Sure. Um, and it's fascinating because size and scale, Jason and I talked, they actually see something in the size that it is if it's gigantic. Yeah. And that's actually on the Milk VR platform for those that have the, even though, and it's got some flaws, it, there's some stitching errors sure. and stuff, but it doesn't matter because we're learning. And, it's pretty transformative. You watch this thing from the top and you go, wow, I had no idea the space shuttle was so gigantic. 
Mm -hmm. uh, even though you know it's got a half the size of a 747, but you can get that experience, which is an impossible theoretical experience to get unless you're one of the seven guys that was getting up in a genie lift and sure. actually doing it in reality. So you can bring that from an educational and a learning standpoint to a lot of people. And so, that bit, that that bit he just talked about with scale. This is we'll go back to movie making and auteurs and all that. <clears throat> oh, I was always one of the first times I saw it. It's really fun to realize when you're not just watching a movie or I think if you haven't seen VR yet, you tend to think of it like I'm gonna look at a big 360 panorama I can look at. And everybody has, if you see the right one first, everybody has a moment where the person making it will give you some other sense of scale that you've never seen in a movie before. So the yeah. common one is you'll be looking at something like a, like a puppy or something and you're doing the parallax and you're, looking, and you're totally amazed, like you've never seen anything as cool. And then you hear like a bark behind you and you turn around and there's a, there's a 2,000 story puppy behind you. It's because you've never had that experience. I mean, you can see that a million ways in a Michael Bay movie with trickery and, and Transformers, sure. but it, it, the simplest thing of it can be a static flower and a giant flower behind you. That, that mode has not been available until now. You can't actually, and it's not the trick of turning around, it's literally like getting close and also having things yeah. get bigger and smaller as they go away from you. Yeah. Sure. Go ahead. So just on the medical real quick, um, it also has I think a- I movie. I know. Let's go back real quick. So VR has a tremendous amount of power actually for palliative care and for the patients. Yeah. So you can take patients who are in hospital beds and take them somewhere else. Um, my son spent over four months in the hospital, um, <coughs> spent three and a half years going through chemotherapy. Um, doesn't like needles much. We would put VR headset on him and he wouldn't see the needle. He would just be somewhere else relaxing. And it turns out it's not the actual needle stick that a lot of the kids going through what he went through hate. It's the anticipation. It's the seeing it. Mm. It's the stress. Yeah. And that's what makes them freak out, not the actual small needle stick. There are, so there are, that's and, stuff that we looked into that's you know, personal choice to, to go that route with these things. Yep. And now we've started looking at like how this technology can be applied with eye tracking to ALS patients. I have to say, like, you know, at CES, we saw a lot of uh, biofeedback um, devices, things that will calm you down, mm -hmm. things that will read, you know, the, the brain waves, and then you could do breathing exercises. As I was using the, the Chris Milk um, demo yesterday, and for those of you who've been in it, all of a sudden you hear birds chirping, you're in the wilderness. I mean, I thought I was listening to Yanni in a spa for, for a couple <laughs> of minutes. It did have an effect on the environment. And I think one of the things that has freaked me out recently about VR, as now I've done it, I guess, four times, is that when you're watching film or you're playing a video game, there's a suspension of disbelief. But when you're in a VR setup, um, you have to constantly remind yourself that it's not real. That's right. And for those of us that have played around with it, you know, I've jumped off a building now, and that took, you know, I think Ted five minutes to get me to jump. I think he pushed me off the building um, because I was so tentative or the train, you know, running right into me. Um, that obviously is going to have, whether it's be, uh, via games or film, everybody is going to seemingly react to virtual reality differently. And what I've read about, and Jason, you and I have spoken about this recently, um, a lot of these companies are employing ethicists, um, psychologists, doctors. It's one of the reasons that you're speaking to other people with you know, different acumen. How do you build mass market experiences where the reaction to virtual reality is so individualized? Well, and if you think you have trouble separating it now, a couple more turns of the technology, when the resolution of the devices get higher and higher to the yep. point where your brain can't actually discern, is it really happening? Oh, I thought I was, not? today when I put it on, I thought I was actually smart. We don't think, and I, I would say <laughs> Oculus doesn't think we're there yet either. I don't think anybody here would say we're there either because you still have the perception that it is a screen. You can see the grid sometimes and you have an awareness of it, but that won't be that for very long, especially if the impetus to do this and create this and the manufacturers of these panels see this as a, a potential future for the industry of visualization, it's gonna be very fast when the point of, you will really need people thinking about the ethics and the psychology of this because there is a potential that you won't wanna get out of it. So I, you know, which like, is and we, and pretty we found We have found yeah. in just uh, <clears throat> bringing various folks into the bunker in the lab at Fox that it is incredibly subjective. I mean, there are folks who are um, predisposed to sort of nausea, people who get sick in cars, people who don't like being on boats. Those people will be the first to tell you, oh, I'm very nervous about this, I might get sick. Um, what we've been really careful about, and we've spoken to Oculus, and obviously you know, everybody up here talks all the time about, how can you create experiences that push that envelope, but at the same time 
don't get anybody sick. So as throwing soon as up that won't happens, be considered. Like if you got someone to throw up, that's not like a really good heart. It's not a bad and no. No. They'll never go like, back. I mean, if I threw up doing VR, I, you'd be, it'd be hard pressed to get me to put that back So up. I find it fascinating. We hear about these terms like uncanny valley or body transfer illusion yeah. are now becoming, you know, regular speak. I mean, what, what is, do you guys know what body transfer illusion? I just looked this up on Wikipedia. It's this idea, you know what you it is? Yeah, you get so the, you know, explain for the audience what it is. It's pretty awesome. It, it's, well, I was thinking in press, it's not the body transfer. It's where you can start like touching somebody's back and basically have them believe like their hands in front of them or they're in a different space by giving them, usually you, what happens now is you take away a perception. So you like take away sight and if you do the right cues to people, they can have a body transfer illusion. And the idea would be that you actually believe that you're in control of, of a different a hand, of right? a body it's like a robot a hand. hand or something like that. So on the... What, what, what we talk about a bunch in virtual reality is the idea of presence. So it's this idea now that we're trying to trick you or fool you, and you can actually get presence without a whole bunch of high fidelity. So what we're trying to do is transport you. And you'd ask this question about how do you, how are we going to meet out like what people like? And yeah, I mean we could, we're going to test, we're going to look, and we're early days where we all have bunkers. But I think ultimately like the creators and the consumers will figure it out really rapidly. So anybody making something right, like the 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 ultimate thing that people think of are the when we all sit around and have lunch, we're like, who's going to make the scary thing? Like, who's going to make the super? Because right now, you can take super low graphics. I could put you in an empty hall. CGI looks worse than anything Doom ever made. I mean, really low res. And leave you in the dark for a bit. Put some dripping water in. Scare the hell out of you. And it'll, it'll creep you out. And if I pop something out in front of you, it's worse than one of those internet scare th I mean, it's just, it'll freak you out. You yep. described one of my indie games. So, so, that, that, but, so we all do that. And then I go, OK. But that's the kind of thing that we all sit around and think about and watch. But if you think about like people in this room who make things, nobody's actually going to make that for very long because here's the trick. Nobody actually watches that for very long. So what are horror movies going to look like in VR? They're going to be awesome because the creators of them are going to figure out how to make them so that they're calibrated correctly so that the most people watch them. But I think creators will figure that out really so, rapidly. So here's a great example. In a horror movie, it would traditionally be that you know that the killer is behind the lead character because you can see it in a flat screen. <clears throat> but in the horror movie, you may be through the point of view of the lead character, and you would have to do a 360 turnaround. It might be. Or parallax would matter. Or like the traditional thing, like in a horror movie, the old scare was the, you know, the old cat jumping out, right? Like, OK, so in VR, we would learn that's not fun because it actually, when you have high presence, that actually makes you jump in a way you don't want to do. Right. So a scarier thing to do is to show shadows again or to do much more subtle things that'll get you to the same effect of telling a great story, being in the right horror mood. But again, and I just go back talk, to like, You yeah. should talk about one thing we haven't really talked about that's really, really important <coughs> is sound. Yeah. It, oh, yeah. Sound, sound is, yep. sound. in terms of presence uh, and trying to convince someone that they aren't where they are, sound is, I would argue, almost as important and maybe more important at times because sound we can actually really replicate. Right now, we, we aren't at a place in terms of um, the quality of uh, resolution that you look at the screen and say, OK, I'm in the forest with Reese Witherspoon. It looks just like a forest. It looks very good, but there's pixelation. The sound that you hear in the wild yep. experience is exactly that. Absolutely. Right. I would That's say that as, as wonderful as the image is and the fact that you, you can see something in a high resolution, the, the, the sound experience, and specifically the volume, it's where you cannot hear the outside <laughs> world makes it more real for me. For sure. Um, Ted, the next step of that is feedback. So when you guys first demoed this for me in San Francisco, I think you basically, you, you were having me go through the Everglades on a, on a hydroplane or something. Yep. And Ted grabbed some grass from the ground and started like playing with my arm with the grass. And I'm like, yep. I'm hitting the leaves. Yeah. <laughs> so when does feedback, not just going into something or seeing you know, your own limb, but when does actual feeling beyond the mental come back? Well, we're already doing it. I mean, honestly, uh, a year ago, our dragon experience that we took on tour, we have a uh, what looks like a crate in front of you, but it actually has louvers that open up and has a massive blast fan. So when the dragon takes off, we hit you with a lot of air. And as you fly around in the environment, we direct it around, and people don't expect it. And when they've got their hair actually blowing in the wind, like they freak out. That it's all it feels very real. Um, there's a lot of great startups out there, and it's certainly the focus of this, you know this audience today, who are working on tactile vests and feedback. Um, there's an entire set of science right now about uh, using stimuli around your brain to actually make you feel like you're actually feeling stuff. So as that stuff progresses and becomes a bit more safe, 
we're going to see a, a huge jump in that. And so this, Ted, what these guys did is amazing. Yeah. The other thing people here should look up on their phones and on iPads and stuff <coughs> is, is called Birdly. It was at sure. Sundance. Bird, it's yeah. Bird, B-I-R-D-L-Y. Uh, it was freaky. It's amazing. Right. It allows the viewer to basically fly like a bird. You are strapped in, and you can uh, navigate um, essentially the cityscape of San Francisco. Sure. So the setup was you get, you get on basically on some sort of table, you actually put your arms into wings, you put on the headset, you are now um, you know, vertically oriented, and you're flying over San Francisco, and every movement you make to go into the city, to go up, to crash, is a real deal. So, Ted, what, what, is, what, is, the, what is the gear gonna be like to make this happen? I mean, is it gonna be like Woody Allen's sleepers or Gasmatron, and you gotta get into like an orb? I, I, you yeah. know, I don't know. I, I think the VR theme park will be uh, something that people will go to. Um, how many, and then, and then those things always migrate to the home, you know, PlayStation, and so, so the technology's coming to do all that, to be the tactile, and it's also being with your other, your, either your own avatar or someone else's avatar in the experience. I think that's right around the corner, too. So just quickly, next 18 months, film and games, um, both animated and real, what are we going to see? What, what are going to be the experiences? Are we going to see a 90-minute film, or are they going to be more five-minute experiences? I, I think from us, we won't see the 90-minute film. I think definitely the Sundance crowd, they're doing it. Um, what we are trying to do, frankly, is, is create the premium experiences. Um, while we're really proud of, we feel like we need to top ourselves. We're hoping we can come up with the right idea and the right plan for our Thanksgiving movie, The Martian, with Matt Damon, where he's left behind on the, it's based on the, the self-published book. Um, we, we feel like we have to top ourselves. And ultimately, like, it, it's, it's very cliche to say this, but it's always story. Wild was a story. The Martian will be a story. Um, Night at the Museum, with, you know, going and talking about the educational part of it. We hope that we'll be able to be with somehow Owen Wilson and the other guy and Rebel in and, and be in the museum from that little point of view and go to the Can Louvre, go to the, you know, Museum of Fine Art, wherever. The educational value to make education more fun in VR, uh, I think is something Palmer. But is it ultimately a, a home experience or is it going to be in theaters? I, look, I think, I think what this goes back to the other initiative we have is to, to make the, the, the theater, the cinema experience more immersive, which is what Ted's working on with Barco and The Escape. We did Maze Runner in a, in a very immersive theater. We really want to push exhibition to be better, more immersive, more relevant, uh, more interactive, yeah. um, and use more of the canvas than just this, that, that it's more it's Cinerama on steroids. Do we think it's both? Us to do, it. do we think it's both? Like there's gonna be folks that push that way. Yeah. But like if you think about like we're doing it because we like iPads and iPhones and things like yeah. that. Like we think we're gonna put it in everybody's hands. Because sure. that's that's where all the interesting stuff and happens. We're we're seeing the expensive goggles, but I use the cardboard goggles and they're pretty damn good. Um, the expensive yeah. goggles are still for you too. They're not that yeah. expensive. The the cardboard stuff can be great for video. I think for limited game stuff it can, can be very good. It's a nice platform, it's a great entry level way to get into it. It doesn't offer true presence, that no. sense that you are there. That's where the premium stuff comes in. And even the premium we're talking about is really not that expensive. I think really from all of this from us, DreamWorks VR is our platform where it's going to be over the next 18 months more content coming out from us, but also tools and partner content as we actually seek to engage the audience and how they can make content creatively. Well, listen, I think this is a monolithic moment in entertainment and education. Um, every time I put these goggles on and I go into another <laughs> world, I'm pretty amazed. These are the guys that are making it happen. I, we could go on all day, but uh, we got to wrap up. Um, and I want to thank you for being here. And uh, it's a really fantastic topic. Thanks. Thank you for having us. Thank cool. you. Thanks.